So you've heard a bit about renewable energy and you've decided it's the solution to climate change. Or you've thought about it really hard and you just don't think the technology is reliable enough to support a whole country. Or you've heard literally nothing and can confidently say you have no idea. No matter which of these three we are, if we actually tried to visualize how much effort it takes to reliably go 100%, the vast majority of us would be left with no idea and nowhere to start. As it turns out, there are a couple of big problems engineers run into when they try to make this change. But where it gets interesting is finding out what we can do to get around these problems and how much it'll cost society to pull off. So welcome to Seed. Something you might have heard before is that renewable generation of electricity is intermittent and unreliable, but it might help just to know how much this matters when you're talking about electricity. The answer is in what makes the electricity market different from any other. Here, look, this is Joe. He owns a coal-fired power plant and uses it to sell electricity to the city of Cityville. This little relationship obeys the nature of supply and demand, except for the fact that at all times, Joe's supply of electricity has to exactly match Cityville's demand because of how electricity works. Once you generate it, it's either used instantly on the grid or it goes to waste. It's like selling milk that spoils after five minutes. Anyway, the art of maintaining constant balance is what many electrical engineers are responsible for doing 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, since small mismatches in supply and demand can often have serious consequences. For as long as electricity has been around in Australia, this has been managed fairly well, but once you chuck in a bunch of generators that only work when the sun shines or the wind blows, things get a bit harder. You see, wind and solar generators usually feature sharp spikes in generation up and down, which you might now realize can be a massive problem for that balancing act. When you get big disturbances like the end of every day for solar panels or random weather events for wind, other services have to fill that gap, and fast. Depending on how much we rely on renewables, this can be too fast because big things like coal generators can't ramp up in time to meet that constant demand. This is what makes renewables intermittent and difficult to balance. What also sucks about renewables is let's say you build a wind farm capable of putting out 1000 megawatts of power. That 1000 megawatt capacity is what you pay for, but the wind hitting this turbine won't be on a regular full blast like you want it to. In fact, the average amount you end up receiving over a year is somewhere below 40% of capacity, or even less. So that brings us to the big question then, surely if we just start chucking up turbines and panels around the country, all these half assed generators will eventually add up to what we need, right? How much would that cost? Well, luckily for you, that is a major research topic for energy experts all around the world, including Australia. So after reading all of their publications and asking around, I can confidently say the answer to your question is, nobody knows. Okay, when I say nobody knows, I mean heaps of researchers have made predictions of what it takes, but with very different outcomes. And it's not like anybody is strictly right or wrong either, since so many factors are involved in trying to predict the future. What people end up doing is just setting a few assumptions. The way they do it is first by establishing a long list of everything they want to consider and all the costs associated. Then they get massive amounts of data for weather patterns, industry stats, electricity demand, you name it. Finally, they run it all through a computer simulation and see what it spits out. All while making sure that even through periods of extremely low wind and sun, the generators would still be able to carry us through. So the results of using this method can at least put that whole baseload power debate to rest. I have to warn you though, dealing with such a massive system like the electricity grid, these researchers quickly find there's an infinite amount of things they can consider, which would make things infinitely complex. So if they tried to consider every single factor involved in this massive system, their computers would just be bound to break and die, meaning in the end they just have to neglect a few factors if they want to come to an actual conclusion. That being said though, their predictions for what it takes to go 100% are the best we have, even if they should be taken with a rather large grain of salt. But enough already, let's get into the juice. What does it actually take to go 100%? How many wind turbines? How many solar panels? How much money? So over in the Australian National University, a professor named Andrew Blakers with a team reckons an investment of roughly $168 billion should set us straight. As for how much that builds, they say we would need the equivalent of every fourth house on the grid having 15 good solar panels on the roof, plus another 40 large solar farms around the country, 180 large wind farms, 80 small dams of water for storing electricity, and a couple more interconnecting cables around to help with the spread of everything. So is that a lot? Let's take a look at this graph. This shows the combined capacity of all our current generation, and this is what Blakers says we should be aiming for, and what's attainable with another $168 billion. Oh, and by the way, this tiny sliver of battery storage represents the world's biggest battery over in South Australia, that Tesla one. Now compare that with the minimum storage we might need with pumped hydro, that thing where you pump water up a hill to store potential energy like a battery, 
It's a lot more. But let's talk about that cost value. What if we spread $168 billion between now and 2030? Over 10 years, that could break down to $16 billion every year, or $4 billion every quarter, which is actually only like 4% of government spending. Anyway, reaching 100% by 2030 would still be very rapid deployment, but probably a bit more attainable than many out there believe. As for the effect it'd have on actual electricity prices, Blakers says it might increase a little or decrease a little, depending on how cheap the technology gets in the future. But how does this study match up with what other experts are saying? Is it reliable information? Well, in all fairness, there are a couple of important things it doesn't consider. First of all, the price they specify for all that pumped hydro storage. Yeah, they'd say they use a lot of it around Australia, but they seem to cut a few corners and give a suspiciously low capital cost for constructing all of these dams. Otherwise, a big consideration they had to omit was how electricity actually flows around the grid. Like I said before about the complexity and the computer breaking and all that, the simulations they run have to be simplified to not worry about that. And this is a problem because using large amounts of wind power from all directions around the country, like they say to do, can really mess with the grid for a bunch of technical electricity reasons. It's also worth noting that all of Blaker's conclusions are for the national electricity market, which covers roughly 90% of the Australian population, but only these states. So, the costs they give are a bit optimistic, but what about other studies? Well, there's this other professor named Manfred Lenzen, who with his team decided to take a bit more of a high cost approach. What Lenzen did differently is he said out like, okay guys, we're going to make sure the computer doesn't build too much wind, and we'll cover the whole country, and we're not going to build any storage, and we'll assume that the wind and sun only generate at like 20%. So what that ends up doing is giving a result like this, and I mean, they don't actually say in their report what kind of capital this requires, but using their cost model and a rough calculation on my end puts it around $630 billion just for all the generators, not including anything else. They do say though that it would really increase the price of electricity. But back to the graph. You'll notice they still use a fair amount of wind, yet where the big bulk of the generation now comes from is this thing, concentrated solar thermal, as well as a meaty chunk over here from burning biomass. That's what makes it so expensive. Without batteries or any substantial form of storage, Lenzen's model had to rely on burning biomass to quickly fill holes in supply. Which, by the way, is considered carbon neutral since plant life sucks carbon dioxide out of the air while it's alive and releases it when it's dead and on fire. Then there's solar thermal, which is these massive things out in the desert that heat up really hot to generate electricity but also theoretically can hold onto that heat a little bit and make a nice baseline supply. The unfortunate truth about solar thermal is that Lenzen relied on it having 15 hours of storage time, which is mostly a myth at today's standard of technology. But there you have it. Two very non-definitive answers to the question of what it takes to go 100% renewable in Australia. Like a lot of things in life, nobody really knows the true answer, but the reality of what it takes is likely to fall in the middle of these two, between $160 and $630 billion worth of investment. Which in all fairness is actually not as bad as some people hype it up to be. With the right strategy and the cheapest mix, we can make sure it lands on the lower end. But having 100 million hectares of land to spread generators over with very little population density and bucket loads of wind and sun puts us in a very fortunate position. The worst part about it all is just the massive amounts of uncertainty surrounding investment and the future progression of technology. Though one thing is for certain and that's the importance of electricity storage, specifically cheap storage. Without it, Blakers wouldn't have had a chance at keeping low capacities and capital costs, and neither would we in the real world. But whether that takes the form of pumped hydro, hydrogen, batteries, or anything else remains completely up in the air at this point. And the current situations for those technologies are complex and deserving of their own videos. And oh my god, we didn't even consider nuclear in this video. Oh well, we'll cover it later. This is likely going to be just the first in a long list of videos put out by the channel. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to hear more of, like, subscribe, all that. I'll see you in the next one.